Sabbath Church. Today's scripture reading will be found in Romans 5, 19. Romans 5, verse 19. And it reads, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. May the Lord add a blessing to his word. And today's special music will be brought to us by Chuck Scales. Jesus, Jesus said in uh, Matthew 5, he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, shall, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. What Jesus was saying is that it is good to feel your need. It's good to feel your need. This song is about something that hopefully is a progression in our lives, and that's the progression of recognizing our dependence on Christ. There are decisions I can't make on my own, and there are trials I can't face all alone. But you said you walk with me down life's troubled road, and you said come on to me. I'll bear your heavy. And I fear to face the day. Let me feel your gentle hand leading the way. Yesterday has come and gone, and its trials are far behind. But I'm ever learning alone, and every day I. What is that? Anyone? What is our countenance? It's the way we look, our facial expression, even sometimes our body language, what we do. It's an expression on the face. 
Did you ever hear the uh, statement that was made, and I heard it many years ago, that it takes four times more muscles in your face to frown than it does to smile? You know, we have to put an effort into frowning. But smiling just comes naturally. I see people doing it right now. It's so easy. It just don't take hardly any muscles. You, it's there. You know, and if you try to even fake it, it's not, it doesn't look real. But you can see a grin, and it looks, okay, there's something good going on. But a frown, you know, there's different positions of your body, bottom lip. You know, it either comes up, and you look terrible. You know, and we've, we've, we've become good at frowning even in this world. Someone said it causes wrinkles if you frown too much. You're disappointed. We never did like the countenance that would change on our face when we're crying. And we do all manner of funny looking things with our face when we're crying. It can be a crying because we're in pain or it can be a physical pain, a mental pain, or even a spiritual pain, we can still be frowning. I thought about this story numerous times. It's in Genesis 4, if you want to turn there for a moment. Someone's facial expression and body language, his countenance changed because something happened here. I don't know if we spent too much time studying this over the years, but I thought it was interesting, and it's always was a somewhat of a perplexing thing to me. To God knows everything. And he knew the situation here that was going on with Cain. Because God had favored Abel's offering, but he did not favor Cain's because Cain brought the wrong thing. You can't get a forgiveness of sin unless blood is shed according to the scriptures. <clears throat> But Cain thought it was possible maybe to bring some corn or whatever he brought there from his garden, from the land. And it says in verse 3, And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Did that mean he didn't love Cain, though? No, it didn't mean that. But he did not respect Cain and his offering, and Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Does your facial expression change? Does your countenance fall when you're angry? You know, when the blood rushes up to your face, and, you, you, and it's not blushing, it's blood rushing to your face because you're mad and the veins stick out in your neck I don't know exactly what Cain looked like here but God already knew something was wrong was this premeditated here the, the, the disrespect that Cain had for God when God didn't respect his offering something was already probably going on in Cain's mind he says why are you angry God said this to Cain and why has your countenance fallen and he says this, if you do well, in verse 7, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And it's desire. It says it's in the New King James, but I like, what does it say there in the King James? His desire is for you, but you should rule over him. Given him personal pronoun word to sin or is he talking about something else here how did sin get started in this world if someone didn't bring it in it's almost like there's a reference here to Satan himself you need to rule over him you need to rule over it if you want to call it an impersonal thing sin is, sin is pretty personal sometimes in our life sin lies at the door God said something going on in our heart and I almost want to believe that Cain premeditatedly planned some things here that was going on a long time before he ever lashed out in his anger and killed his brother because of this anger he had 
It's always been an interesting story to me and almost perplexing in our mind. Through one man talking about Adam here, and this text was read, one man brought sin into this world. It transferred to his son and then to another son and another son and another son all the way down to our time. The descendants of Adam are sinning today because one man brought this into the world. God has put in his word that one man is going to be able to get, take care of this problem of sin. To keep us from becoming angry because we didn't like what someone said. And we lash out in all kinds of crazy different ways. A long time ago, there's a man in the Bible by the name of David that knew that he was born into a world that had this nature to it. A willingness to sin when it wasn't what God intended for his nature, to, for human nature to be. But we have that nature now in our world. David knew something about this in verse 5 of Psalm 51. He says, I was born into this. I was born by my mother into iniquity, he says. Something interesting about that. Sin has to start somewhere to get out into the world. And it starts in our mind. You know, this, I always thought this was interesting. You know, we sometimes refer to sin as something we do. But maybe it, at first it's something we think. And it has to go somewhere. David knew he had sinned. A different thing. We read the story. We've shared it many times over the years, studying it. And he knew what horrors sin brings to your life and to the world around you. Some heinous things that went on with him there in his family. He realized he had sinned against himself. He had sinned against others. But ultimately, he realized that he had sinned against God. He said, against you only. Lord, have I sinned. That's who he went to to get his heart clean. He didn't go to someone else, even though you have to go to someone else sometimes and get forgiveness. But he knew he had to get this sin problem straightened out with God. That would fix his mind. He said, in, in my heart, he wanted God in his heart. But it's talking about the cognitive reasoning part of our brain. It's what it's talking about. They're still looking for that place in our brain, the scientists are, where that cognitive part is. They say it's up here in the frontal lobe where our reasoning is and all of that. What we call the heart. I don't know where the heart of the brain is, but God knows. Conversion was what David was looking for. He was looking for his heart to change. He wanted that release from the guilt that he had, and it was terrible guilt with him. And I can assure you his countenance, his face, his body language, his demeanor, everything about him was different. When he finally realized the sins that he had done, what he had created around him and in his family, the things that had brought this high level of guilt within him, his countenance was different. You ever heard someone say, I can tell he's the one that did it. He's got guilt written all over his face. You ever seen that? I can look at his eyes and tell you he's, he's the one. He's guilty. You know, you don't want to go in a court, or set, court setting and tell a lawyer that. They'll let you go home because that's not what they go by. They go by evidence that's revealed. Hopefully, it's, the truth is brought out in a court. But to say that you saw this person is the one. Sometimes we see things in people's faces that let us know there's something going on with their heart. And guilt is one of them. We can see guilt. Confer conversion is the only re release from this. And David knew this because, and we've shared it many times, that you know, Psalm 51, there is the most beautiful revelation of God's interaction with man to save him than any place in the Bible. David knew this, and hopefully we know it, that we can come to God and get released from our guilt.
and it will be a good thing. It will be beautiful. David knew all too well that what it says in Genesis 6, verse 5, it says, the heart of man is evil continually. It was so bad that God had to destroy everyone except for the eight people in the ark. He knew it was bad. David knew this world was full of that. And we wonder sometimes in our own family. We've seen it many times over. We've seen some mean and ugly and hateful and vindictive things going on even in our own family and sometimes even in the church. We see these things. And some of this actually even goes unchecked or unfettered, as they say, in the church because we just don't think it's worthy of some of these open things they claim. It's pretty open to see somebody vengeful, and mean and ugly, and saying the wrong thing at the right time or the other way around. But do we sometimes know or do we all the time know that we should do something a certain way, do the right thing, but we don't do it? If we know it's the wrong thing, the Bible says it is what? It's sin. The Bible says if we know to do good and we don't do it, it's sin. That's what David, I mean, uh, what James said in, in chapter 4, 17 of his book he wrote. And could any of us ever be bold enough to say, I don't know the difference when we do some nasty things? This thing just happened to me. That's just the way I am. We say things like that sometimes. Maybe not as drastic as you know, some terrible, sinful things that the world thinks about as sinful. But at the same time, do we know to do the right thing and then don't do it? I'm guilty of it. I've done it. We've all done it in some form or fashion. Because you see there's a battle going on between good and evil. There's a great controversy going on. And you've heard the stories before, and we used to hear it when we were young kids, and it almost scare you to death when you're young. And you hear someone say, well, the devil's sitting over here on your left shoulder, and Christ is over here on this shoulder, and he's, there's this battle going on, going in one ear and out to the back and forth, fighting over you. You ever heard that? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, we hear it as children. Uh, I don't want anybody on my shoulder telling me what's right and wrong. Someone telling me, do this, and the other one says, no, you need to do this. 1 Corinthians 2 talks about this battle that's going on between, uh, you read that this afternoon if you want to, that where Paul is writing that letter to the Corinthians saying there's a battle going on between the natural and the spiritual person. You cannot know that you're a sinner unless you're, approaching things from a spiritual standpoint because a natural man just can't do it. If he's of the world, he's in trouble because he can't see God, can't feel God, can't sense God's presence. It's a terrible situation to be in. Many years ago, and I've used this thing in the Sabbath school class numerous times, I got so curious about what the words uh, sin and transgression and iniquity, those words that we read in the Bible for the most part defining the big one we say sin <clears throat> and I've heard Brother Ken use this one time in a sermon I think talking about what Moses was asking God there on the mountain when he went up can, can I see your glory it's in Exodus 34 and he said that I was a merciful and gracious God that's what he told Moses Forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. He said there in chapter 34, verses 6 and 7 is where that's at. And it's those same three words, iniquity, transgression, and sin, not necessarily in that order, but there in Psalm 51 to what David said. He realized this is what his problem was. So there must be a progression of things going on here. If God can forgive Iniquity, transgression, sin, they must be all be the same thing, or are they? I got to really looking into that, and I looked them up to be sure. And I got this in my Bible all the time. In the Hebrew, the word iniquity means perversity, that is, moral evil. Moral 
evil. And it says it comes from the root word that means to crook, to do amiss, to bow down, to make crooked. Now, where does a crook in the world, where does his problem start if it's not in the mind? A person is premeditatedly trying to understand, I'm going to go rob this convenience store. But it just doesn't happen. He's walking along. Okay, I'm going to go in here and rob this store. There's a plan. Sometimes sin is, when it's sinning against God, even, is a plan ahead of time. If we're not careful, we can be crooked. We can bow down away from God's boundary of his law. So I thought about this. Let me go here to transgression. It says that it's, and I got the Hebrew words, which I won't try to pronounce. I got the Strong's number in the concordance beside of them, so I can quickly go back. It says that transgression is a revolt, a national, moral, or religious. And I thought about this word transgression. Okay, if sin starts in the mind, it's got to go somewhere. Something has to happen. You have to do something to make it do its job. I've got a plan. I'm going to fulfill this plan in my mind. And it causes great anguish in the world. It comes from a root word that means to break away from just authority, to trespass. And as a note on trespass, it means something that I shared with the children this morning. You trespass away from God's law. Talking about trying so hard to do something a certain way and it never does come about. And when you look at the term transgression as far as something spreading out, trespassing in an area where it doesn't belong, in geology they say that floodwaters transgress the land. And so that gave me an idea about how to understand this thing transgress the land and someone brought up something about uh, the flood in Katrina when it, the dam the levee broke on that one lake down there in, in near New Orleans and flooded that whole city that water from the Mississippi River transgressed the city of New Orleans it trespassed where it wasn't supposed to there was a boundary there it was supposed to hold that water but it didn't work it's the same thing with God's law when there's a thing going on in your mind that causes you to want to break away from the authority of God's law, that's the way we, we term transgression. It's a revolt against God's authority. That's the way the, the term of the word transgression in Hebrew is talking about. And then we have this thing called sin. That's what we say all the time. It's definition in the it's actually from an old Chaldean word that means to an offense or its penalty or even the sacrifice for it is what it says. In the Greek, it's interesting to me, it means to miss the mark where I'm shooting at that target 60 times and I only hit it 50. So I missed the mark 10 times what I was aiming for. And that's the reason to me that this reeks my heart to know that the harder we try to do something, and I realized if I was going to get good enough with that bow to shoot a perfect score every time, I was fooling myself. There's no way possible that that was going to happen. Too many practice hours, too much waste of time. And it's the same thing with trying to follow God in your own reasoning. You'll never be able to do it. You'll waste too much time when you should be sharing the goodness of God's love with someone. Mm -hmm. This trespass thing down here, it says in the Hebrew, and it uses that word in the Hebrew and in the Greek, it means a guilt, a fault. In the Greek, it means a side slip, unintentional or willful. We miss the mark anyway if it's intentional or willful. You know, unintentional or willful, it doesn't matter. To fall aside, it says, to apostatize, to fall away. In its own figurative sense, it means 
to go beyond the limits of what is right, just, or polite, even. And we could put a lot of things in that category. To go beyond, to trespass. It's an amazing thought. And I was trying to think, and Chuck and I were talking the other day about this mystery of iniquity, the Bible mentions. It says in, uh, I think it's 2 Thessalonians 2, it talks about the mystery of iniquity already at work. Talking about some things that are going to come in the future. This man that's sitting on the throne of God thinking he is God. That's terrible <laughs> iniquity there when you think about it. But it is a great mystery to realize how this problem of sin got into our midst and how it's just screwed up everything on this earth. If we're a child of God, we look at it, we're horrified with the problem of sin the way it is. And if, we're, if we have practical experience and we know from personal things that have happened in our own mind and all, we, we, we have something to look at. And maybe we can help somebody, we can share. First John 3, 4 is what we use sometimes to define the definition of sin. What is it? Transgression of the law, it says. In other words, you have to break away from the boundaries of what God's law says to commit sin. It's lawlessness is what it really is. And you read that whole little book there, of First John. It's talking about this subject. His message is about sin when you read that whole letter carefully. James even said, if you know to do the right thing and you don't do it, it's sin. This thing that happens in the world, someone connected all this with covetousness. It's like all the Ten Commandments. I don't know what order God intended to put them in unless it's the order that they're in in the Bible. <laughs> covetousness, the last one on there, and everything else stacks on top of that. If you want something bad enough, you'll break every one of those laws or any one of them individually in order or whatever. However, you're trying to try to do it or not to do it, you're still breaking them because you're trying yourself to do it. All that is in the world, the Bible says, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, that's what's in the world. That's the reason we want to be away from this. It's not what God had intended in the beginning. All that is in the world. Could I ever tell anyone that I really didn't mean to do this? This thing just happened to me. I'll tell you a little story about Mr. Ergel. This man lived in, in our neighborhood and I, he died many years ago. And he had a little orchard in the back of his house. It was an apple orchard. The neighborhood kids had a fence on the road there side of his house and the orchard was over there and I used to walk up that road going to see someone else in that neighborhood and I saw those apples over there on those trees and word had gotten around that Mr. Ergo didn't mind children going over that fence and getting those apples as long as they picked one up off the ground that had fallen from the tree. But some of the kids would go over there and had in their mind this beautiful idea if I shake that tree and the apples would fall down on the ground and then I'm not breaking what he told us we could do. And I thought about that several times when I went by there and I said, I'm not even going over the fence at all. I'm, there's an apple laying over there. It don't look too bad. There's no rot on it. Don't look like it. I could get one of those things. But even as a young boy, I was probably about 12, I said, you know, that, that wouldn't be right. I'm still breaking that man's rule. If I go over there, and I'm not even going over there, even though he said you could go over there and get one on the ground. I wasn't sure if those kids had shaken it out of the tree or if it had fell on its own. It didn't matter to me. I wasn't going there because I didn't want to get in trouble, especially with my family. But at the time of being in trouble with God didn't seem to cross my mind that much, but at least God was trying to reach me. There's something wrong with this. Even... With this sinful nature that we seem to have in this world today, born into it, we can still make good choices, can't we? God says we can have a choice, either to follow him or follow the world. Which one we want to follow? 
We can do good, the Bible says. In John 8, 44, Jesus said that the devil and Satan, Lucifer, whatever you want to call him, that he was a liar from the beginning. And he started all of this, and we can trace that back. We talk about this great mystery of how iniquity got in our midst. The devil was the one that started it. It says he's the father of lies, and he was a murderer from the very beginning. These are the words of Jesus. He knew. He had firsthand experience about how this thing started. But for us to sit around and try to analyze in our mind, where did sin come from before it? Where was it before it got into Satan's mind? That's a mystery we will never understand. Don't try. There's a call to sin out there in the world, right along with a call to repentance. And if we're not careful, we can be falling into this trap of following the adversary as opposed to following God. There's a call, there's a draw, there's a temptation out there. It's everywhere. Everywhere we look, we have to be on our toes, as we say. We have to be listening and hearing the tone of the Holy Spirit in our heart. We really have to. You read about that text in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Y'all know what it says. What does it say? No temptation has taken us. That is of such a nature that God can't make a way of escape. That's kind of a short version of it. Mm -hmm. Nothing that goes on in this world that God has left here with us is of such a nature that God was make a way of escape if we're tempted to do something that's ridiculous. Remember what God said to Cain. You shall rule over him. Why would he tell us that we can overcome that if it wasn't possible? something in the word it says you can overcome sin he that overcomes can have the right to the tree of life all these different statements that are made there God told that to Cain and he's telling it to us today Cain knew what he was planning he had premeditatedly done some things he knew what he was going to do and I'm not going to say that he ever didn't know he had a choice to do the right thing so what about us? Can we seriously say to someone, it just happened? After all, I have this sinful nature, you know. I'm born in a world, I don't have an excuse. God has the remedy for iniquity and transgression and sin. Amen. And it's Jesus Christ. Amen. It's been the way the whole time. The homework for this afternoon is read that whole chapter 5 of Romans. It covers that, that little thing there. It's a beautiful place. Actually, what he's trying to convey to the Roman people, he starts right there and kind of goes on for two or three more ch ch chapters there. So we can't ask a question, is there a cure for this? Because we know, yes, there is a cure. It's a statement instead of a question. There is a cure. This is the whole narrative of the Bible because the Bible talks about this great story of redemption. Trying to redeem man back from this fall that makes our countenance change. And for the most part, our countenance is falling all the time when we're sinning. I love this. John Earnhardt got me started with this years ago. In his lectures, he would have, and I went to numerous ones in different places. Matthew 121, where the angel came and was talking with Zechariah, telling him that no one, Zechariah, who was Jesus' earthly father, Joseph, told him that uh, about to get the tangled up with the two, that uh, his wife, Mary, was going to have a son, and he would call his name. Jesus, for he would save his people from their sins and not in them, John used to say. And he would be real vocal about that. From your sins, not in them. You know, we can't be saved if we're in sin. 
I thought that was interesting the way he's putting that. And he kept on using that in the, in the story. I thought that was good that that's the way he shared that. And uh, I thought about it many times. If the world only knew that those of us who understand this have a message to share like this, that if you want to know what's going to fix this world, it's Jesus Christ. Amen. If you just knew that, people would be lined up down 49 trying to get in here to hear a message like that. But no, that's not the case. They don't want to hear this. It's too brutal. It means I have to change my lifestyle. I don't want to do that. I just want to go into the kingdom and not make any adjustments. No, that's not the way it is. This whole narrative of the Bible is about this. Forgiveness of sin is the cure for our problem. But we have to desire to be forgiven. The desire to do terrible things is one thing, but you've got a desire to be forgiven too. And that's God's nature, to forgive us. Because he said, I would forgive iniquity, transgression, and sin there in Exodus 34. He can do that. You ever thought about this word forgiveness? What is it? I thought about it a lot. And I looked it up in dictionaries trying to trace it down, how we got this word in the English. I know the word give is in there. We can't just say, well, I want to get me some forgiveness today so I can go to this person and tell them I'm sorry. You've got to have this thing in your heart all the time. It's got to be a fixture with you. It doesn't, it doesn't take some kind of gesture or some kind of maneuvering and manipulation and posturing and everything to come up with a plan to go and ask forgiveness. No, it's got to be part of you that you automatically know how that works and you want to do it. Especially when you realize that if I ask forgiveness from this person, I'm saving his life because he's done something terrible to him and he's in terrible shape mentally and spiritually. And so you go to him and you ask forgiveness for what you said or what you did. That's a life-changing thing for that person. You're giving that person his life back. I wrote some notes down about forgiveness. I looked it up says it's uh, for all things. Well, just imagine this. Forgiveness is a pardon. If you've done something terrible and you're going to go to jail for it and the president gives you a pardon and you're set free, that's a pretty profound thing to happen. If you do that to another person, it's just as profound because you're actually releasing that person from something. If they've done you wrong and you're getting forgiveness and they come to you and you can see the countenance of that person when they're in a forgiving mood. You can see the difference from that and then having mean and ugly face, frowning face. The person that's asking forgiveness, his face is smitten with this grimacing pain that he has to be released from. That's the reason forgiveness is so difficult for some people. They don't want to go there. It's a reciprocal agreement between us and some other person. And in the case of David, it was he had to get this agreement with God that his sin was forgiven. That would clean him up. Hopefully, David did the right thing and asked him forgiveness from other people too, the stuff that he had done and who those he had done wrong. Would you like to have a release from the agony of guilt? We all would want that. And sometimes we're too late, maybe. We don't go far enough. And some people carry burdens of guilt around with them for 50 years. And it's a terrible thing. It ravages families. It rips apart churches. It does this because it's an ugly thing. It will change your countenance to get forgiveness or to give forgiveness. It will. So the question might be today, and getting close to the end of this thing here, how or where is your countenance today? You know, I mean, I can't stand in front of a mirror and make a smile when it's not real. I can change my muscles around a little bit, but 
You know, it keeps wanting to go back to its original position. It's like a rubber band smile. And that's what we do sometimes. We really don't want it to come out of the heart. God's plan looks at us and sees us trying to shore up our face to keep it from falling by doing all kind of crazy things that make us feel good and look good or whatever. We would never make it as a cosmetic salesman because there's not enough stuff out there to make us look good. God is the only one that can help this problem. And putting on a false face doesn't work. And we've been, a lot of us have in the world have been carrying a false face around way too long. And all we have to do is just give it to God. You ever heard someone say that salvation is too hard? When actually when you look at the way God has it set up, it's it's simplistic. It's an easy thing to be forgiven and follow God. It's the easiest thing there is. That we're the ones that's making it hard because we try to do so much on ourselves. We try to put this burden on ourselves to do this when it never was mentioned anywhere in the scriptures that we could do this. It never was mentioned. So it's time for us to maybe stop scheming and posturing and complaining about all the different things that are going on with us and with our family, with the church and everything, and just be the witness that God asked us to be. Amen. I think that's what God is asking. When he said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. <clears throat> Let's read it again. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. You know, you can be in sin, and God is calling you. He's calling you to come out. That's what the, the beauty of this whole thing is. And somebody panicked one time when we realized that Jesus knows our frame, the Bible says. He knows everything about us already. And he came in the likeness of sinful flesh himself, it says in Romans 8. He already knows what we're dealing with because he lived here among us. He knows what we go through. So it's not a big deal to think that God doesn't understand my situation. No, that's not proper thinking to get into. All of you who labor and are heavy laden, add this in there, with, laden with sin. And I don't want us to be going around being having a pity pot with us everywhere we go thinking I'm a sinner and all this. God doesn't want that. He just wants you to turn aside from anything that you're doing that he said is, is not following his law and be just give a shout out for those that are walking down the road smiling and they don't even know why they're smiling. It's just the fact that they've got a good countenance about them. I knew this boy in school. I thought at one time I hated him. He had this smirky look on his face. I thought it was a sinister grin at one time. I didn't know what he was up to. And I got to know him, and he ended up becoming one of my best friends. I was in the sixth grade. Never will forget Billy. Found out that that smile he had on his face wasn't really a smile. It was just the way his face was shaped or something. And and I, I, you can't go by the way people look. you got to go by the way they it's like somebody said, you, you can't go by who this person is. You've go, got to go by what they do. you got to watch them and see what they do and how they treat you. And that was the same with Billy. Jesus can give us victory. I believe that. And he can lift up our fallen countenance. That's the way he is. That's who he is. And that's why he came here. We want to release from the agony of guilt, we can come to God and he'll make everything right with us. That's what, and there's more notes than I could even imagine I had on this thing, but I've tried to condense this down to like, it's about 40 minutes right now. So thank you for letting me share this with you. And, and I hope that, you know, when we're fighting to make ourselves look good, that we don't have to force ourselves to smile. It just comes natural because God is in our heart. Amen. Let's pray. Father, what a wonderful thing that you've done to reveal your plan to us in your word. There's so much information on this subject. From the beginning to the end of your book, Lord, you've left a great plan here for us to be 
saved in your kingdom one day. And, it's, and you've given us the prerogative to choose you or not to choose you. But you've given us plenty of evidence, Lord, that you are the ultimate expression of goodness and righteousness in the world. Your government is ruled by that. You choose to be part of that and live for eternity in an environment like that, that, Lord. That's a wonderful and worthy thing to look forward to. And that's why I've chosen to recognize you as someone that's worthy of my worship. I hope, Lord, that passes on to every one of us, that we accept this, we realize it's not something we make a little list of details of what we do to follow this road, and we'll just do it naturally because that's who we want to follow. Thank you, Lord, for the way you can work on every heart. You can enter our thoughts with the power of your spirit. You can change our lives, but you don't change. This is the way you've been all the time. So help us to understand this, Lord. Let us feel your presence. If there's someone here that needs this assurance, we just pray that that person's heart will feel you and be touched by you today. Thank you, Lord, for the great mercy and grace you offer to us. And let us feel your presence as we be a proper witness for you, Lord. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.